Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, <clears throat> it's lovely to see so many folks who are choosing to spend some time on a Sunday morning <clears throat> sitting still. Um, and daring, daring to look. Zazen always feels to me um, like a fundamentally courageous act when done, when done as intended. Um, so I thank you for sitting. Um, yeah, it really matters. So I'm gonna call my talk today, Two Fires. Two Fires, because I've been thinking a lot about um, the fire sermon, the fire sermon given by um, Shakyamuni Buddha, some 2,500 odd years ago. Um, I've been thinking about it probably because of how the world feels to me much of the time these days. Um, feeling very much sometimes to me like everything is on fire. And so after spending a little time <clears throat> with the fire sermon from 2,500 years ago, I'm reminded um, my perception is correct. The world is indeed on fire. This is nothing new. So um, that's what I'm gonna talk about. I'm gonna talk about that and then I'm gonna talk about a second way of understanding uh, fire from kind of a Mahayana point of view. Those are gonna be my two fires. Um, <clears throat> and so I'll start by reading just a short passage from the fire sermon if you're unfamiliar um, with it, it's easy to find. Um, it's easy to find online if you just search for fire or Buddha fire sermon. Um, it's relatively short. The, the part that we actually pull out and call the fire sermon is actually relatively short, just a few pages. But this is from the Pali Canon. So uh, the recorded teachings of the historical Buddha. Um, I'll just read a small section for you this morning. <clears throat> he's addressing, um, he's addressing his nuns and monks but more importantly, um, part of his audience, at least at that time, was um, some folks who were new to the Dharma who had come to hear him talk as part of the myth around this, part of the story around this. And those people were fire worshipers. <clears throat> and so um, doing what skillful presenters, skillful teachers do, kind of know your audience, right? He knew that these folks were fire worshipers. This is going to be their primary um, image. Their primary, their primary focus is the element of fire, and so he used fire as his uh, teaching metaphor as he delivered his uh, dharma that day. So part of that is just skillful means trying to connect to an audience by using their using their language. Right. Um, <clears throat> what's also probably helpful at least for me to remember, is that uh, a good portion of his audience we can imagine would have been brand new to this kind of practice. Introspection, uh, meditation. Um, we can guess that they probably had no introspective uh, meditation experience, no inner awareness, uh, at least not cultivated as such. Uh, these are beginners, essentially speaking. And so it's not only important for the Buddha to use a, a metaphor, an image, fire, that makes sense to them, but also to address the teaching to their level um, of kind of development, um, right? That's, so what he's delivering is a very, very basic teaching, uh, a central tenant of early Buddhism um, that a lot of us are already familiar with. So the passage that I'll read to you goes as, goes as such. Bhikkhus or, uh, or bhikkhunis, the monks and nuns, all is burning. 
And what is the all that is burning? The eye is burning. Forms are burning. Eye consciousness is burning. Eye contact is burning. Also, whatever is felt as pleasant or painful or neither painful nor pleasant that arises within eye contact for its indispensable condition, that too is burning. Burning with what? Burning with the fire of greed, the fire of hate, with the fire of delusion. I say it is burning with birth, aging, and death, with sorrows, lamentations, with pains, with griefs, with despairs. Um, so that's probably enough to give you a sense of what the fire sermon has to say, although I recommend spending time with it. Um, it's well worth letting those words wash through you. <clears throat> so he is delivering a very basic Buddhist teaching that existence is suffering. Life is characterized by suffering. Uh, we know this because this is the first noble truth. This is the first noble truth of Buddhism. Samsaric existence, uh, human existence on earth as we understand it is characterized by suffering. And in particular in this teaching, he's telling these uh, both experienced and new students that the source of the suffering is internal, right? The world has its pains, but the source of suffering is internal. So this is the field of practice. Um, really for all Buddhists. This is where the rubber of our awareness meets the road of our lived experience. And we sometimes in Zen describe suffering as wanting things to be different. And that takes the form of greed and that takes the form of hate. Things we want more of and things we want less of, different in the sense of things I want more of that I want and things I want less of that I don't want. And we also describe suffering as not seeing reality clearly, actually misunder misunderstanding or misapprehension, and that's ignorance, right? Or just unawareness. So there we have our three poisons, greed, hate, and delusion. Unawareness, ignorance, right? He is telling his audience that day, the Buddha, that suffering is universal and that it is constant. And this teaching expresses the awareness of a person whose blinders have been removed by years of meditation, years of introspection, devoted and dedicated and difficult and disciplined practice. And he saw with great clarity and he delivers with great clarity in this teaching, a description that all the world is burning. All the world is burning with suffering. And this is a hard truth to see. And it is harder still to allow ourselves to see. It is hard to face the fact that life is so difficult and that the abiding undercurrent of all of our experience is primarily characterized by bad. This earthly existence is samsaric, bad, it's bad. The fire sermon lists all 16 datus, uh, components of experience and describes them all as burning. The, sec the section that I read uh, used the eye, but he goes through all six senses. <clears throat> and all 16 datus, all the separate objects of knowing, all the separate things known, all the separate consciousnesses that connect them, all of these are filtered through our own karmic patterning from the three poisons. So all of our realms of knowing are always to some degree characterized by, touched by, on fire with suffering. And the idea of this teaching is that once we see that our six senses are on fire with suffering, we can start to choose through practice to naturally withdraw from our six sense bases. 
that's the intuitive leap that we would all make going, oh, all of those senses are on fire. They all hurt. The withdrawal instinct is pretty natural. So this stage of teaching uh, in the evolution of Buddhism, the Buddhist tradition, is mostly concerned with the senses and matter and form part of human life, suffering experienced that way. And hence the desire to escape, right, uh, to nirvana, a non-human state, essentially, right? So the Buddha's fire sermon describes <clears throat> the world we live in, a world we're familiar with, a world we inhabit every day. Um, the Buddha's fire sermon describes achieving liberation, the possibility of freedom from the burning of suffering through detachment from the six senses. That's the word that's repeated, 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 repeated throughout the fire sermon. When you read it, you'll see that word, depending on the translation that you find. Usually in English, the word chosen is detachment. Liberation and freedom is found through detachment from the six senses or dispassion. Dispassion, which from the Latin root literally means no suffering or not suffering, dispassion, not suffering. Dispassion, detachment, um, central to early Buddhism. Um, I've heard it said more than once that dispassion is a guiding ideal of orthodox traditional Buddhism. And from this fire sermon teaching, we can see why that is. We can see that, right? Disidentification with the suffering. Dispassion as a guiding ideal of traditional Buddhism. So we're gonna fast forward to October 18th, 2020. And Zen, because Zen is not Orthodox Buddhism. Zen has its own orthodoxy, but that's a little different. So although Zen includes uh, and upholds and honors traditional understandings in our Dharma, we also include other understandings and other expansions as well. And in our Mahayana Buddhism, our, our guiding ideal is not dispassion. It is come passion with suffering. It's kind of easy to imagine that dispassion and come passion are related. And a lot of the practices are actually uh, adjacent in some ways. We can see them as stages of practice if we wish. But it's also easy to imagine them as opposites because one is not suffering. The detachment that is described in the first fire sermon, in the fire sermon of the Buddha, whereas compassion is the opposite, to be with it, to literally be in relationship to it, right? In the Mahayana stage of the teaching in the evolution of Buddhism, in addition to being identified with our human experience, just like we are in the fire sermon, we are also identified with consciousness itself, life, spirit, uh, Buddha nature, whatever term we wish. Um, and hence our desire, our ability, our capacity, our longing even to encompass, include, relate to, care for everything, right? We don't leave the burning, suffering world behind through detachment or through dispassion. We recognize the suffering of the world as ourselves. We practice in it. We practice with it because it's us. And so we in Mahayana, in Zen, we have another fire, a second fire that really <laughs> is the original, actually. This is the fire of life 
itself, the fire of consciousness itself, the fire of infinity, the fire of Buddha's compassion. This is the fire of our inherent luminosity. Consciousness itself is luminous. The word luminous comes up a lot in English translations of Zen uh, teaching, luminous. Can you feel the light? That's a different kind of fire. So in Zen, we include, of course, the dharmas of form inside, the dharmas of emptiness, shunyata. Shunyata is the dharma of infinity. It includes the world of the finite, the world of form, the world of humanity, samsara, right? This is what Zen calls the world of the red dusts. It includes all of that, but we do not detach from samsara. We find nirvana inside it, part of it, non-separate from it. The Buddha Dharma of emptiness does not detach from anything because it includes everything in non-separateness. So we have another way in Zen of relating to that fire that the fire sermon so beautifully and so intensely describes. We have another way of relating. Why? Because the Dharma of infinity loves what we hate, right? Infinity, infinite Buddha loves what we hate. Infinite Buddha includes what we as humans don't want to include, right? Infinity, think about it. Like what greedy person would infinite Buddha deny and push away? What hateful person would infinite Buddha disown and disavow? What deluded person would infinite Buddha feel a need to attack or to vanquish? What Mara would infinite Buddha not acknowledge understand, set limits with, but always relate to. None, of course, right? Infinite Buddha would always meet greed with generosity, hate with compassion, delusion with clarity. He would acknowledge, understand, set limits with, but relate to everything. Infinite Buddha, he'd reconcile everything to himself. The Buddha nature, the kind of consciousness cultivated in our zazen should relate to everything in experience, including suffering, especially suffering. That's why Katagiri Roshi described our zazen as a chosen position of vulnerability. When we choose to see what is true, we must also choose to allow ourselves to be vulnerable to the felt sense of it. Come passion. And this is rare, but it can be cultivated. It can be generated with courage. If we have courage, we can generate this capacity in our zazen. We can choose this, we can choose to exercise this muscle, we get better at it, right? And it takes great courage to acknowledge suffering and to move toward it, to allow, to allow ourselves to experience it. The Buddha found in Zen doesn't feed Mara, but always offers him tea. There is a relationship. Why? Because Mara is just Buddha in disguise, right? Buddha has no limits. And so to Buddha, the world being on fire, as it is, is a real thing. But it's first an experience to hold and to relate to. It is not first a problem to be solved. Can you feel the detachment in that second idea? This is our normal way of being. Do you feel the distancing? 
when suffering is defined as a problem to be solved. We do this internally with our own suffering all the time. And hence we do it externally in the world all the time. When the suffering of one person or even the whole world is held in the vastness of infinity in big mind, it's not so much. It's not so much. In fact, since suffering is finite, it's actually, it's actually quite small when held by infinity. Suzuki Roshi famously said, you're, fam you're perfect as you are, and you could use some improvement. Most of us know that quote. So in Zazen, this looks like, can we bring our, you're perfect as you are, to our, could use some improvement. Can we bring the Bodhisattva's infinite heart to the burning world of samsara? Right? <clears throat> Bhikkhus, all is burning. Bhikkhus, all is burning. All is burning. Well, without fire, there is no light. Without fire, there is no light. The fire of suffering shows us the edge of our awareness. The boundaries of our ability to perceive, recognize, accept, connect, and to know. The shore of our suffering is the shore of our capacity in a human body to evolve as a Buddha. We need the human experience if we wish to expand and evolve, or else we can't see where the edges are, right? Without suffering, we have no catalyst for enlightenment. Remember, uh, in Mahayana Buddhism, the six realms, the six realms of existence, the human realm, is the desirable realm to be in. That's the one you want, the one we're in, the one that is on fire. It's on just enough fire. That's the one we want to be in. We don't want to be in the heaven realm because nothing happens in the heaven realm. Nothing happens in the heaven realm. Nothing gets done because no one there cares. Because compassion dies without suffering to feed its fire. No mud, no lotus. No grit, no pearl. No fire, no light. <clears throat> Ida B. Wells was an American investigative journalist, educator, and an early leader in the civil rights movement. She was one of the founders of the NAACP, and she said, the way to right wrongs is to turn the light of truth upon them. Good to see it. And Louis Brandeis, the US Supreme Court Justice, said, sunlight is the best disinfectant. Sunlight is fire, right? That's what sunlight is. It's the light from fire. So the original fire that we're talking about here is the nature of realization that can come about from practicing with the fire sermon. The original fire is the nature of realization itself. It's that split instant when you see something you didn't see before, you learn something you didn't previously know, the beam of your inner flashlight, that light turned inwardly that Dogen talks about, lands on something you hadn't seen before, felt before, known before. You just got a little bigger. It's that moment when the inner light recognizes a familiar shape, it's seen but not been able to understand or integrate. Right? The original fire is a moment of integration. It's a moment of expansion, the flash of insight. Flash, that's fire, that's electricity, right? Flash is a connection made in the mind, a literal, a very literal, and also figurative moment of fire, energy, 
of spirit. <gasps> Animation that connects, that links, that creates awareness, makes the field of awareness bigger, right? The depth of understanding deeper. Real spiritual practice is a deep evolutionary impulse obeyed and a fear-based ego disciplined by compassionate and wise awareness. The true activity of Zazen. Flash. Right? A moment of fire, original fire. The flash is a moment of emptiness, <gasps> right? Or thusness, suchness, because it's a connection. It is connection making, right? A moment of emptiness is simply a, a moment of experienced, actual, integrated, non separateness, right? Do you see it? It's, that's all emptiness is, non-separateness, right? Non-apartness, inter and intra-suffusion, radical, non-selfness, total non-abidingness. But do you feel that it's connective tissue? Ah, bing, bigger, bing, more, <gasps> see, light, right? That's what a moment of emptiness is. That's the original fire, right? The original fire is Avalokiteshvara's burning heart of compassion, right? Manjushri's flaming sword of the perfect wisdom of non-separateness, the willingness to include the fire in your own heart mind when you have an insight into your own greed, your own hate, your own delusion, and the fire's light of awareness falls on a landscape previously kept in the darkness of unawareness, and you see it flash, there's the original fire, right? That invisible halo of just energy, light, that surrounds you when you do your zazen and your heart mind makes a connection. It includes something it didn't before. It expands to hold and care for a suffering you have previously been unable to acknowledge. Whoosh. That's the flash. The original fire is our own individual and collective burning vision of awakening in which everything is illuminated from without and from within when there is only the dancing light of this very ceaseless, dynamic, life-taking and life-giving movement. Finally, not only beyond life and death, but also only just this ordinary, everyday miracle that we call our life. Right? Maybe, maybe it's helpful to, to be reminded, to acknowledge that normal waking consciousness right, in humans is heavily defended against this. Right? Normal waking human consciously is heavily defended against both its fear of nothingness, right? death, shame, um, but also it's fear of everythingness, enlightenment, Buddha nature, God. <clears throat> Actually, because to the everyday waking human consciousness, ego self, they're both annihilation. So kind of honestly, most of us don't actually want to know. We talk about wanting to know, but we sort of don't. We're pretty ambivalent about our own possibilities of actually waking up. We mostly kind of don't want to know. <clears throat> Thomas Merton, the famous um, Catholic mystic who worked with um, Thich Nhat Hanh, I think the Dalai Lama too, said, there is no way of telling people that they are all walking around shining like the sun it was as if I suddenly saw the secret beauty of their hearts 
the depth of their hearts where neither sin nor desire nor self-knowledge can reach, the core of their reality, the person that each one is in God's eyes. Have we ever had a vision like this? Have you ever had a moment, even if it was just a few seconds of looking around and seeing everybody illuminated from within? He says, shining like the sun, they're on fire. It's a different kind of fire. Both fires are happening at the same time. They're suffering, but they're also light. <laughs> they're a being of light. Aren't we all? In this passage, I love because it's a dramatic description of a dramatic insight into the real nature, the true nature of a non-dramatic moment. People just walking around, going to the store to buy grapes. It's like Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Right? This is just non-dramatic, normal life. The truth that we live inside our lives that are illuminated all of the time, whether we recognize it or not. He saw that we're all burning. Burning not only as vehicles of suffering, but we are burning also as vehicles of enlightenment. Consciousness, Buddha, in human form. Right? That same insight that he expressed, that Merton just expressed there, into true selfness or emptiness, is also expressed in this passage. Might be a little more familiar to this audience. There is no form, no sensation, no perception, no formation, no consciousness, no eyes, no ears, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no sight, no sound, no smell, no taste, no touch, no object of mind, no realm of sight, no realm of mind consciousness. There is neither ignorance nor extinction of ignorance, neither old age and death nor extinction of old age and death, no suffering, no cause, no cessation, no path, no knowledge, no attainment. It feels like a direct response to the fire sermon. All of those things are true and they are all empty. Can we see why the Heart Sutra is so radical as, as an attempt to express the perfection of wisdom? Imagine that freedom, no suffering, no cause, no cessation, no path, no knowledge, no attainment. Do you also notice the fire was never negated? It's never taken away. It's negated and not negated. The negation is negated. I see it's there. I see it's there and there's no place to go. We're not separate from it. How can practice and enlightenment be too? How can samsara and nirvana be separate? How? Can we see how that passage from our Heart Sutra includes the validation of the truth of that original fire sermon teaching, but it also includes all that goes past it. One moment, one moment of simple, genuinely mindful awareness, one moment of actual zazen is a complete shattering of all of the samsaric patterning of conditioned consciousness through the door of the truth of suffering into the boundaryless landscape of the truth of the compassion that meets that suffering and the perfect wisdom of the emptiness that holds it. Imagine that freedom. And that freedom is you. It's already your true nature. It is already your, already your original fire. Because as human as you are, you are also eternity. The part of you that is suffering, your body, your ego identity, and this whole heaving and dying earth is very real. And also, those parts are impermanent and they're changing all of the time. And your very real experience of struggle does not determine or describe your limits. You are vast like space. And so you can include the world's suffering and you can include the world's burning. It's okay. 
it's okay to include it because you're vast like space. Have you noticed that space is holding a burning earth? Have you noticed that's happening right now? It's holding it. Because it's not okay as stuff is right now, as not okay as our lives oftentimes are, it's also actually okay at the same time. There is deep peace and contentment possible right here in the burning world of suffering. The good place was inside the bad place all along. Loving the bad place is the good place. Loving the first fire is the second fire. So don't be defined, please, by the fire that you experience or the fire that you witness. I'll, I'll end with this. I just invite you to notice the moments that already populate, their, populate your life, the moments when you're okay or something works. Notice what's okay. Just notice what's flowing. Notice what's okay. Notice where there's no struggle, a moment where there's no struggle, right? Notice the space inside of and around all those flames. Don't negate the flames, they're there. Just include something else. Include this second kind of awareness, right? Because that space is already happening, right? That freedom is already happening along with the flames. Your peace is already happening in the midst of your chaos. Just like in our beautiful world. Because we're vast like space. I think this is, that's as much as I need to say today. Thank you very much. I appreciate your attention. Um, <clears throat> and